Welcome to St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Rochester, Michigan. We're so glad that you can join us for this pre-recorded service for the first Sunday in Lent, February 21st, 2021. Join us on Sundays for our live stream service at 9 a.m. on Zoom and Facebook. And on Zoom, we also continue with Coffee Hour, Sunday School, and Youth Group on Sundays as well. You can also join us on Zoom and Facebook for our Noonday prayer service, Monday through Thursday at 12 noon. During Lent, we have a number of programs which we hope you'll participate in. Our Phone a Friend program is a way of linking parishioners for prayer and connection. Uh, once a week during Lent, if you got assigned to someone and don't want to participate, please do let us know right away by emailing the office and we can reassign the partners. There's also a brief video from the Reverend Ann Weber uh, about listening skills and a little guide to the Phone a Friend program. That's on our website, stpfeeds.org. Anne has also put together a number of Lenten resources for your own reflection and use at home, and those are also on the website. Our Thursday Lenten programs start uh, this coming Thursday, uh, February 25th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And don't forget Centering Prayer on Saturdays as well. Virginia Higgins has shared with us her discipline of the God Box. We invite you to do that as well. Uh, every day that you fulfill your Lenten obligation, whatever it is, you put a, some money in the box. And if you don't fulfill it that day, you put double the money in. And on Easter, we'll gather all the God Boxes and make a donation to Neighborhood House. All those details are on our website. And you can also subscribe there to our newsletter, The Epistle. And now let's prepare ourselves for worship, center ourselves, and invite God's presence. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy on us. Holy and mighty redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. Holy Immortal One, Sanctifier of the Faithful, have mercy on us. Holy, Blessed, and Glorious Trinity, One God, have mercy on us. From all evil and mischief, from pride, vanity, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all evil intent, Savior, deliver us. From sloth, worldliness, and love of money, from hardness of heart and contempt for your word and your laws, Savior, deliver us. From sins of body and mind, from deceits of the world, flesh, and the devil, Savior, deliver us. From famine and disaster, from violence, murder, and dying unprepared, Savior, deliver us. In all times of sorrow, in all times of joy, in the hour of our death and at the day of judgment, Savior, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your birth, childhood, and obedience, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, Savior, deliver us. By your ministry in word and work, by your mighty acts of power, by the preaching of your reign, Savior, deliver us. By your agony and trial, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, Savior, deliver us. By your mighty resurrection, by your glorious ascension, and by your sending of the Holy Spirit, Savior, deliver us. Hear our prayers, O Christ our God. Hear us, O Christ. Govern and direct your holy church, fill it with love and truth, and grant it that unity which is your will. Hear us, O Christ. Give us boldness to preach the gospel in all the world and to make disciples of all the nations. Hear us, O Christ. 
Enlighten your bishops, priests, and deacons, especially Michael, Bonnie, Wendell, and Stuart, Eric, Anne, and John, our priests, Brianne, Lutheran bishops, Elizabeth, Donald, and Craig, for our diocesan household, especially St. Elizabeth's and Christ Church, and in the Dominican Republic, Moises, their bishop, and St. John the Baptist and Bonau, with knowledge and understanding that by their teaching and their lives they may proclaim your word. Hear us, O Christ. Give your people grace to witness to your word and bring forth the fruit of your spirit. Hear us, O Christ. Bring unto the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived. Hear us, O Christ. Strengthen those who stand, comfort and help the faint-hearted, raise up the fallen, and finally beat down Satan under our feet. Hear us, O Christ. Comfort and liberate the lonely, the bereaved, and the oppressed. Hear us, O Christ. Keep in safety those who travel and all who are in peril. Hear us, O Christ. Heal the sick in body, mind, or spirit, especially Freddie, Carlton, Paul, James, Marge, Sarah, Elise, Kathy, Rose, Sylvia, Paul, Kim, Rad, Chris, Frank, B, Catherine, Gregory, Karen, Rob, Sue, Rebecca, Jan, Megan, and Ray, and provide for the homeless, the hungry, and the destitute. Hear us, O Christ. Guard and protect all children who are in danger. Hear us, O Christ. Shower your compassion on prisoners, hostages, and refugees, and all who are in trouble. Hear us, O Christ. Forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and turn their hearts. Hear us, O Christ. Hear us as we remember those who have died, and grant us with them a share in your eternal glory. Hear us, O Christ. Give us true repentance. Forgive us our sins of negligence and ignorance, and our deliberate sins and grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your word. Hear us, O Christ. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. God be with you, and also with you, let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations, and as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament this morning is from Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, God said. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, 
This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm this morning is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love, and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right, and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. The epistle this morning is from 1 Peter. Christ also suffered for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring to you God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water, and baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, 
You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we begin this first Sunday in Lent, our Lenten pilgrimage as we follow Jesus out into the wilderness uh, for this time of fasting and prayer, uh, we will be hearing from some of the great stories of the Bible. In particular, one of the themes this Lent in our readings from the Hebrew scriptures is the great theme of the Bible, which is covenant. A covenant is a kind of contract. Um, in this case, in the Bible, uh, between God and humanity, a sacred contract, a sacred relationship, and it really is the essence uh, in the Hebrew Bible of the relationship between God and humanity. In fact, we call the Bible the parts of it uh, according to covenant. We call it the Old Testament, which means covenant, and the New Testament, uh, the new covenant in Jesus. And it's tempting to think, therefore, that there was only one old covenant, right? The one that uh, somehow gets fulfilled or replaced, depending on your theology, uh, by Jesus. But in fact, when you read uh, the Hebrew scriptures, in particular, the book of Genesis uh, and Exodus, um, you will see that there are several covenants that God makes with humanity. The first really is the covenant of creation, where God commands humanity, be fruitful and multi multiply, uh, fill the earth and subdue it. I don't like that word subdue. I'll come back to that. Um, and in return, uh, I will bless you. Um, that's the first covenant, although it's not uh, the same kind of covenant that we'll see later. And the great covenant that we often think of, of course, is the one with Moses, that moral covenant. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments um, and brought them down to the people as the sign of God's relationship and also um, the rules by which they were going to live as God's people. But before Moses and after creation, uh, there are a couple others. We'll be reading about the covenant with Abraham uh, in the coming weeks. But today we have a really interesting covenant, I think, a unique covenant that God makes with Noah. But if you read this passage from Genesis carefully, you will see that this covenant, unique among all of the rest, is not just with Noah. It's not exactly a moral covenant. It's not about laws. It is a covenant that God makes with every living creature. So it's with Noah and his descendants, but then it goes on. I make, I'm establishing my covenant with every living creature, the birds, the domestic animals, the wild animals, um, all the animals that came uh, into the ark and were preserved from the flood. And the sign of this covenant is the rainbow, uh, the sign that God is not going to destroy the earth uh, with the flood. Now, if you read further, you see that the rainbow is a sign of the covenant between God and the earth itself. Think about that for a minute, that God creates a covenant, establishes a relationship with the earth itself. The Noahide covenant, as this is often called in Judaism, is the sort of theological source uh, for several things that have been um, really important in the history of Judaism, and I would say later Christianity. The first is that all peoples of the earth, you know, you think of 
in Judaism, the, the importance of this idea of chosenness, you know, that God had selected uh, this people, uh, the children of Abraham, to be a special people uh, beloved of God in a particular way with a unique calling and purpose. Um, that chosenness is really essential in Judaism. But in Judaism, there's also this tradition that God's care, God's uh, relationship is with all the peoples of the earth, every tribe and language and people and nation. That is really important. It's a very inclusive covenant uh, in that respect. It's less about the chosenness of one people and more about the chosenness of all people. And then it also goes on to be about the chosenness of all the animals. All living creatures on the earth have a sacred relationship with God. I mean, God created all these things. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, God creates every category of life and calls it good. And in a sense, God blesses every part of the creation. And then God's relationship goes beyond even the animals to be with the earth itself. For me, this is crucially important as I think about my own relationship with the natural world, with the idea that we are not separate from creation. You remember I said in that uh, creation covenant that God commanded humanity to fill the earth and subdue it? That word subdue has been a problem for, I think, religious people, uh, Jews and Christians in particular, um, because it sort of set us over and above creation. That creation was there for our use. We could dispose of it as we wanted to. And boy, have we, have we disposed of a lot of creation. Um, not as good stewards, which is also a good biblical word, caretakers of creation, which is the way I read uh, the first chapters of Genesis, that our first job, our most important job, is to be the stewards and caretakers of this fragile earth, our island home, as Prayer C uh, in our prayer book calls it. Um, but instead, sometimes we've seen uh, the earth is just something to be used and abused. Uh, and that has led to some really uh, significant costs in our life on this planet. This idea of being caretakers of creation, that God has a love and a relationship with creation, I think can shift this idea for us that we're not here to use and abuse creation, but to care for it and to see ourselves as part of this amazing web of life, part with a special responsibility because of the gifts that God has given us of intellect and so forth, but that we ought to be using those to sustain and preserve life uh, and not to end it. It's sad to me that the environmental movement has been politicized over the years seen as just the arena of one political uh, party or movement and not of the rest. Because to me, of all the issues that beset us, this should be non-political. Uh, it's about human survival and about how we thrive in the context of this planet. One of the uh, sad things I was just reading uh, recently was the loss of true wilderness in the world. You know, as human population has soared, uh, well over 7 billion people on the planet now, we've pushed further and further into areas that once were wild, uh, untouched by human civilization. And as we've done that, um, we've lost the sense of wilderness. Um, we have created some uh, problems of deforestation in Africa and Latin America. Um, if you think even of problems like the pandemic, uh, as I've read about the origins of that, and there's still some dispute, of course, about that. But one of the issues they say is that as human beings push into areas where we never were before, 
we are coming into contact with um, animals and with bacteria and with viruses that we never had contact with before. As we um, manipulate animal species and mix them together, I think of these wet markets, you know, you see in, in some places, you know, we are, we're affecting the natural world and bringing things together uh, that cause issues and can create a perfect environment for the spread of things like the coronavirus pandemic. It is too late, according to most um, uh, ecologists, to stop the human uh, impact on the world, if we even could. Um, we now need to kind of manage that. We have to be stewards and caretakers in a different way as we uh, use our uh, technology and our uh, intellect and our science uh, to try to find ways to mitigate the effects, the negative effects of human population and spread uh, on the natural world. Uh, things like overfishing, um, pollution and so forth. It's, uh, it can be overwhelming, but I feel a great tug. You know, I've shared this, I think before that, that I feel that, that I need to be part of that work in some way. And I don't know what that looks like. I invite you, if you feel that way to talk with me, maybe there's things that we can do as a church um, to be involved in this. And again, not as a political thing, but as a religious activity. Um, as we meditate deeply on what it means to be part of this creation that God has made. Behind me in my picture here is uh, a wilderness that is really important in our gospel today. This is the wilderness area that Jesus most likely went into for those 40 days and 40 nights. It's the wilderness between uh, Jerusalem and the higher elevation uh, to the left and Jericho down in the valley to uh, the right there. This is what it looks like today. It probably looked a little greener in Jesus' day, uh, but it was still a wild uh, wilderness. Um, it's where the bandits uh, hid out who um, beat up and robbed the man in the Good Samaritan story. Um, it is the place where Jesus went. It was the place for Bedouins uh, to pass through uh, but it was a bare and empty place in many respects. Mark gives us this very brief uh, story about Jesus in the wilderness, and it's a fascinating one. It's a place where Jesus met Satan, who tempted him. It's a place where Jesus met the angels who ministered to him, and it was a place where wild animals uh, prowled. Um, wild animals and angels and the devil. What a fascinating uh, place. It was precious because it was the place that prepared Jesus for his ministry. He was thrown out into the wilderness by the spirit uh, for these 40 days after his baptism uh, for this time of clarification is the word I think of, uh, a place where he could gain a deeper sense of who he was and what he was called to do. And I think that's what wilderness can do for us too, it can be clarifying. You know, those who love hunting and fishing and being in the outdoors, you know how the cares of the world kind of fall away when you're out in wild places um, and you can see a little more clearly and get a deeper grounding in yourself as part of this world. It's something you can't do on a computer screen, um, but you can when you breathe the fresh air in a forest or see the sunrise um, on a mountaintop. I mean, it's, uh, it's precious and it was to Jesus. So as we enter into the wilderness time, spiritually of Lent, it's worth thinking about how we might gain some clarity, both about our place in this world as part of God's creation, as stewards and caretakers of the world, but also how we might sense and feel and be more 
connected uh, to God. Uh, that's what Lent always has been for me, that kind of refocusing on my relationship with God. I'm using this year one of my favorite books. I've used it some other times as well. The Desert, an Anthology for Lent by John Moses. It's got little short readings each day um, about the desert and our spiritual life. And I want to quote in closing today a brief quote from um, from this book. This is a quote from Frere Ivan. I don't know who Frere Ivan uh, was, but this is a quote in the book um, talking about the inner desert, the inner wilderness. There is a physical desert inhabited by a few exceptional men and women who are called to live there. But more importantly, there is an inner desert into which each one of us must one day venture. It is a void, an empty space for solitude and testing. The desert turns you inward. So this Lent, I invite you into the wilderness, into the desert, to turn inward and to listen for and to find the still small voice of God, to perhaps encounter the devil in temptation, the wild animals, those threats that uh, can really uh, challenge us, but also to see angels and to know that God's care for you is infinite and eternal. Amen. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength, so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>